if we're looking at script three, I want you guys to look at script two and look at script three, what's different between them. So in the first one, it's a string of all eights. In the second one, it's, it's characters. But what's unique about the characters? It's a sequence though, isn't it? Capital A, lowercase a, zero. Capital A, lowercase a, one. You guys notice that? Capital A, lowercase a, two. So the reason for this is we wanna control this register called the extended instruction pointer. The extended instruction pointer is what's about to execute. If I send my string of A's, I just set script two and the app crashes. If you look in the bottom left corner, it says access violation when executing 414141. And the reason is because EIP has 414141. The computer thinks it's supposed to run that, but since the computer doesn't know how to run the letter A, that's why it crashes. It doesn't know what to do. It's trying to execute it and it can't. So the whole purpose of us doing this fuzzing and wanting the app to crash is because if the app crashes, then we know that the computer crashed because it was trying to execute our code. So now we have to send this non-repeating sequence of characters because we want to see the distance to the EIP register. Okay? Because now once you know the distance to the EIP register, let's say the distance to the EIP register is 5,000 bytes, 5,010. At 5,011 bytes, you insert malware. A lot of people, when they talk about a buffer overflow, they think take contents of big cup, pour in small cup, right? When data spills everywhere, they think they have a buffer overflow. That's not a buffer overflow, that's a crash. What you want is you wanna send more data than the app expects, but you need to overwrite the instruction pointer and then stick malware in there so that the instruction pointer runs your code instead of the application's code. That's a buffer overflow. So the reason that we wanna send this cyclic non-repeating pattern is I need to know how far away EIP is. So let's say for example, EIP is right here. So what I wanna know is from here to here, how far is that? So I'm gonna run this guy and I wanna look at this 396F4338. What ends up happening is when you, when you start looking at exploitation, you really have to be conscious of what's in the registers. The reason you have to be conscious of what's in the registers is because if the register's right from this way to this way, that's little Indian. If they write from left to right, that's big Indian. Now let's go see if we can use our ASCII chart. And with your ASCII chart, can you look up those numbers? Look up those numbers in hex and tell me what they are in char. So 38 is an 8, 43 is a C, 6F is an O, 39 is a 9, all in hex. So I'm going to look for 8C09. So now what I want to do is I want to look for that distance to EIP. So if you look here, you see that I'm searching for 8C09, and I found 8C09. Here it is. So this all used to be one string, line 8 and line 10. Once I found the 8C09, I cut it off there, and then I print the length of the string without that. 
So now when I run it, it'll come up and spit out a number. And he says, your distance to EIP is 2,006 characters. We calculated our distance to EIP. Once we calculated our distance to EIP, now we want to redirect code. So let's see how we redirect code. All right, so it's 2,006 characters. So what I want to do is at my very next script, I want to build out uh, my distance to EIP, which is 2006. And then I want to overwrite EIP with four Bs. All this does is just check to make sure that I can get there. So I'm going to run that. And now when we look in EIP, EIP has four Bs. So that's really what I wanted to do. I just wanted to know, could I get that, you know, distance to EIP? I'm just gonna show you guys our script two, okay? Now, if you look here, you can see my A's are in EAX, my A's are in ESP, but in EBP, I don't have anything here. And in EIP, I don't have anything here. So I need you to realize that in this particular case, EAX is a container, right? Your data's in it. You can look in it and see your data. ESP is a container. You can look in it and see your data. EIP is a pointer. He is saying your data is over there. Your data is over there. The problem is you're pointing to somewhere that it kind of doesn't exist, right? So it's just kind of off in no man's land. What we really want we want to point to an area that we control. So we want to tell EIP, jump to ESP. If EIP goes here, we're jumping to an area that we control. We can change those A's to malware. And then if you jump from EIP to ESP, you land in your malware and you run it. We don't want to jump to ECX. We don't want to jump to EDX. You don't control it. If you jump there, you can't make it run what you want to run. Now that I proved that I can control EIP, what I want to do is I want to look for a DLL that has an instruction that's going to help me jump to another area of memory that I control. So in this case, I'm going to take this instruction to try to jump. These are called system DLLs. These over here, this is a third party DLL. So I wanna get this jump ESP from here. So I'm gonna double click in here or right click in here and search for a command. I'm searching for a jump ESP. I'll set a breakpoint on it. So opcode FFE4, that's the address of my jump ESP. And now if you take a look at my exploit code, that's what it's doing. It's gonna send 2006 A's. I've got the address of my jump ESP written backwards. And then for what's left, I've got uh, the remaining 990 bytes. So what I'm hoping is that if I hit my breakpoint, in other words, if I overwrite ESP correctly, I'll overwrite ESP with this address. And then this will be in ESP. All right, beautiful. So if you look here, your breakpoint hit. Jump down, you look over here. And now if I jump into ESP, I land in all my C's. Um, at this point, you replace these C's with uh, shell code. So let me debug, restart. Okay, so now if you look, this thing says that everything else is the same, distance to EIP, jump ESP, right? And now what it's gonna do is it's gonna open a bind shell on port 4444. So that's the reason why we're gonna run this netstat command 
the C of port 4444 is open, we've replaced those Cs with an actual payload. So now if we run this script, I double click on script seven, and now if I just up arrow and run that netstat again, you'll actually see that I have a listening port. So now that I have that listening port, I can just connect to it. And then you'll see that it drops me right down into a command prompt. The folder where the application is actually running. So this is what's called weaponized exploitation. This is you writing an exploit for a piece of software. Okay, so let's quick review our steps. So you're looking for unknown vulnerabilities. Unknown vulnerabilities. What are the three types of applications? Of these three types of apps, how do they take in data? If you want to attack a standalone app, you have to craft malicious input that can be consumed by the application, malicious file input, malicious keyboard input, malicious mouse input. So one way or another, data goes into the app, the app acts upon the data. That's what we're attacking. Now, how do we attack a client server app? The network, you communicate with it over a logical network port. What about a web app? So in this case, this client server app runs on port 9999. Okay, your next step, map and fuzz application entry points. Every command uh, that the app takes is an entry point, command, method, verb, function, subroutine, controller. Every point of entry, when data acts upon the app, the data that acts upon the app, that's what we're attacking. After that, your next step is to isolate the crash. Once we put the app inside of a debugger, we then could see we could get it to crash in the same place all the time. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, after that, then we calculated our distance to EIP. EIP is what's about to execute next. It's the extended instruction pointer. So having control over EIP means you can control what's about to run but you also need to know what registers you control because you don't want to jump to a register that you can't control. So we call that program redirection. So we search for a DLL file and we look for a jump instruction or an equivalent instruction that gets us to a place that we control so that we can run whatever we have sitting in the place that we control.